<laughs> oh, so Robbie, you're in a car. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was going to do this from my car and I was like, Rob, this is a Robbie move. He will do it. He would do this from the car. And then I got stressed out and was like, no, I got to race to the, my Airbnb. Let me, let me give you my tips and tricks. If you do it from a car, make sure the windows are open. Otherwise you'll start sweating profusely. <laughs> But the airflow is no good. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Future. Oh, yeah. Um, where are you outside of in your car? Outside of my neighbor's house. I tried. Oh. I've tried, <laughs> tried doing webinars on my Wi-Fi before, and it, it'll like the connection is good at the start, and then over time the connection wears out, and I start getting glitchy and pausy and. <laughs> I don't trust my own home Wi Fi for 45 minutes. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Robbie, you got to hardwire into your neighbor's connection. Just run, run a line from their house. So when you're out in front of their house, you can plug right into the computer. Yeah. That's, take this so that's a very good idea. <laughs> well, that's why we have you on for expert tips and opinions today. And <laughs> yeah, we, why we don't you say, introduce our guest? Yeah, we will. Uh, this is Michael Saracini uh, of Keyspire. He's, I, I'm actually going to have Michael kind of introduce himself here, but he's a real estate wizard guru yeah. I, don't, I don't quite know how to to phrase it he's uh he's helped you know tens of thousands of people invest in real estate uh he's got a, a really keen eye for uh what's going on and, and how to help out home buyers out there actually michael i've, I've been look i looked through your bio and i read it a couple times and i don't want to just read off a sheet here so can you tell the audience kind of your your background a couple highlights that that you'd like to share versus a pre -camp? yeah it's really interesting and i don't know about wizard robbie i think that i can attribute everything i know about real estate at this point to this great group of coaches i have i've got a coaching team across north america and they learn so many different things and in our meetings we just have these amazing brainstorming sessions that allows me to bring some of the greatest things to you here. Uh, but really, it's an interesting story because real estate wasn't my first business. I've been doing real estate for 23 years now, but it wasn't my first business. And I knew that when I started, uh, I, I wanted to be rich, like most 20-year-old guys. I'm like, okay, I got to do something that's going to that's gonna make me rich. I want to make an impact, right? I want to have the cars and the boats and all of that great stuff. So I did something that you would expect any 20-year-old to do that wants to be at that place is I started a boy band, right? Pretty obvious. I saw photos. I, I did. Did you I see? Test that. Yeah, yeah. If somebody Googles Next Element, uh, that was the, and this was before the days of even YouTube. This was four or six years before YouTube. So there's not a lot of stuff out there, but we've let a couple of photos or they've just kind of leaked over the years. Next Element Band, you'll see some of our old photos. And that was the very first business I started. Um, and, uh, it was really interesting how that played out. We we did really well. We played for thousands of people all across the country from these little shows and fairs to these bandstands and these outdoor concerts, multi-group concerts. Uh, and then we went down to Nashville to start selecting a location where we were going to record our album. So it was like, my mind was blown. This was like, you know, the fast track. I was going to make it. But then something happened that often happens in life. And I didn't realize till over a decade later that this is just part of life is our record company went out of business. They went bankrupt. And all of a sudden, all that hard work, all that excitement, all of that hope for the future was erased literally overnight. It was gone. And I was stuck in a rental house with four other guys, my buddies that were bandmates, and we were all you know, unemployed. I guess band doesn't pay any money anyway, being in a boy band when you're starting out. But we were all just starting from zero again. And that really helped me reframe what I want in life and how things were going to be different going forward. And I think this is an important kind of message or an incident for a lot of people. I promised at that moment that I would be in control of my future, that I wouldn't have anyone else or anything else in my control, in control of my future, whether it's the, the government or an employer or uh, the economy I would be in control. And so I was actively, I didn't know what it was, but I said, I need something to put me in the driver's seat. And that's really where my my story starts. I love the way you're phrasing that. Um, I just started a nonprofit called First Home IQ and our tagline is actually own your future. Um, and I think there is like this sense of, you know, that, I mean, real estate in particular and financial literacy and all of that can give you that option of, of really, you know, taking ownership over that. So anyway, I love your story. 
Yeah. Wait, and and continue. Uh, yeah. Uh, stop at the end of the boy band. How do we get into real estate? Yeah. So how we get into real estate. So this theme of being in control has come even to this day in my life. And uh, when I created Keyspire over 13 years ago now, the whole concept of the organization was to create an organization that puts people in control of their future, as opposed to creating an organization that makes some someone rich and you know super wealthy and Ferraris and private jets. That's not that's not what we do within our community. You know, people might do that and might want to buy those things, but really, we're about like you said, Kristen. Like, how do you own your future? How do you feel more confident every single day based on the actions you take today? So that's what I was after. And that was what's programmed in my mind. So a couple months went by after you know the, our life got erased. And when you're 20 years old, this is the biggest tragedy I had experienced at the time. A couple of months went went by, and uh, I did something with my um, my roommate Scott. Him and I, we did something that we do every month. It was routine. It was our job to take the checks to the bank. We would take the the collect all the money from our housemates, and we would bring it to the bank and make the deposit for the landlord. Now, this was before the days of e-transfer and all kinds of fancy stuff that everyone gets the benefit of today. We actually had to walk over to the branch and do our deposit. Uh, and so we would walk over and we would do the deposit. But something interesting is the landlord set up the deposit so that we would, wouldn't deposit in the account, but we would deposit right on the mortgage. So we would pay the mortgage right off. What that means is the printout they would give us had the actual mortgage information on it. So one one time and just serendipitously right after this this event of the boy band going to zero, we went and we put the checks in the bank and the teller asked, she said, well, would you like a printout? And we said, oh, sure. We normally don't get a printout. We just had to know, ah, sure, we'll take a printout. We got the printout and it said you deposited and, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like, okay, you deposited $1,500, mortgage pay down, $800. And we were like, holy cow. We're paying $1,500 every month, but our landlord is only paying $800 in order to, to carry the house, to pay for them. There's $700 every single month that we are giving away. And that's when the light bulb went off for both Scott and I in the branch, in the bank. We said, we have to be on the other side of this equation. And that's the moment that everything clicked to be in control, what we were looking for, being on the other side of this income property equation was the key for us. I, I can attest to that. I got a a 30-year fixed rate this last year, and I was looking at the amortization schedule of it, and about 10% of my monthly payment goes to the uh, principal, and the rest goes to interest. And so I'm going, there's got to be a better way, although I, I kind of leapfrogged a step here. Rather than going mm -hmm. to a landlord, it's going to the bank. But still, so you you went from seeing that, and you said, i got to start my own company, or i got to tell people the the truth about what landlords are doing to them, or where'd you where'd you go from there? Yeah. So I, I think the natural next step is um, we didn't know. We had no idea what to do. Like the how is different than the what or the where you're going. We just knew and I just knew inside this is where I needed to be. I needed to be a place where I owned multiple properties and I was getting a few hundred bucks per month of passive income from every single property, just like my landlord was. And instead of only owning one, I said, what if I could own enough properties that I never had to work again, that that passive income would pay for my, my mortgage, my food, my entertainment, my travel, my kids, all the things that one day I really wanted to do. And then my mind shifted from being rich as the goal and being wealthy to having passive income so I didn't have to work. And that route made me realize, and still today, that is the most important thing to me is having passive income versus having a private jet. And so that that's the next step is where, where, where I want it to be. The how, oh my goodness, the how is now the tough part. How do you actually do it? You know, what are the next steps? And just to, just to give you something in terms of, you know, it was eight months before I bought that first property, but uh, I also worked at a restaurant at the time. And that was kind of covering just the bills and the bare necessities. And so uh, realtors would always come in for lunch. Realtors seem to go for lunch all the time. So now that my mind, my lens was on to look for this type of opportunity, I would talk to every single realtor that would come in and I would start learning every single, every single lunch shift, I, not the dinner shifts, only the lunch shifts they came in. And I started learning and making friends and making this little network of realtors through the restaurant. That would, that was my next step. Just kind of the situation I was in, I found the people that could help me. 
Michael, not to jump ahead um, and let me know if my Wi-Fi doesn't stick with you here, but um, I I think and talk a lot about how today's generation of first-time home buyers are really in a difficult place, I think, when it comes to entering the market. And, you know, I'm curious as you are, you know, building, you've built a team of people who, you know, help people get into this, like, what kind of advice do you have? And I, I know I'm I don't know. What kind of advice do you have for younger people who want to get into this space today um, and or the professionals who are trying to help those younger people get into a home ownership today or, 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 you know, investing in real estate today? Mike, I'm going to jump in real quick and say I had you on my podcast a little while ago. And the most poignant thing you said to me was the model of 1950s home buying is obsolete and people got to get that out of, out of their minds. So maybe that's where you're going. But maybe if not, you could work that in. Yeah, I thought. It'd be yeah. Bad. It's so true. And, you know, I'll kind of build a little context of our typical member at Key Spires, 40 to 60 years old. And a lot of them are getting to the stage where the kids are starting to move out and going to college and university. And so they come to us to build that retirement future because they realize the market's not doing it. Um, but out of that, the, the, the byproduct of that is their kids are 19, 20, 21, 18, you know, they're between that 20 and 25, like that Gen Z. And so we're learning a lot about the challenges that they're having and how to support them through our members. And now they're becoming on becoming members. And so I can say a couple of things. Number one, the main challenge of, uh, of what's happening individually for these people is just like you said, Robbie, is they have learned and are running a model from the 60s today in, 2000 and in the 2020s. They're running an old model. What is that model? It's I go to school, I get a good job. I climb the corporate ladder, I pay into my 401k, I pay into my pension and and uh, magically at 65 it all works out and I I get this income stream for the rest of my life. And that model worked back in the day when home prices were $30,000 and you know in New York and back in the day when um when uh, inflation was in check like it was a different time. It was a very different time. Today, two, 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 two pivotal moments happened in history. In the 80s, consumer credit card came out and that completely changed everything, consumer debt. There was very little consumer credit cards before the 80s. And then in the 90s, of course, we had this amazing technology that if, if you've heard of it, the internet completely changed everything. And so now uh, the model is completely different. You can't run the 1960s model. You have to run a new model. That model is very entrepreneurial. That model has to do with taking care of yourself and being able to add value to the marketplace as opposed to depending on others. So that's the big picture of, of what's happening here is running that old model uh, today. And any millennials that have uh, learned that, any of the Gen Z that have learned that, I'll just generally say Gen Z, you know, it's 11 to like 24, but really that that anyone who's getting into the market, you could be 35, it doesn't matter. Anyone who's getting into the market uh, or starting out trying to run that old model is going to is gonna run into massive challenges and and probably barriers that are uh, are really difficult to overcome. So you mentioned <clears throat> Keyspire's members are 40 to 60 year old. Can you give us a little context on what Keyspire does, what you originally started the company with the intention of, uh, who you're helping, those sorts of things? Yeah, the the way it's an interesting story how we started Keyspire. Scott and I wanted to get educated. My business partner in real estate is still my business partner with Keyspire. Um, and we were a couple of years into our investing career, we realized that, okay, we need a little help to get to the next level. Um, and probably more importantly, we didn't want to learn by trial and error anymore. We didn't want to make the mistakes. We didn't want to lose thousands of dollars on a deal if we made a little bit of a mistake. So we wanted some guidance and we started educating ourselves. So the very first event we went to was a three-day real estate workshop. And I remember being completely underwhelmed. It was we, we learned very little. Our books were still closed at the end of the first day. And all they could talk about was buying with no money down, no money down, no money down. And we're looking around and we're chatting with everyone in there. And the things that they were teaching were just, they were really, they were really entertaining, but they weren't practical. And I realized that many years later, there is no such thing as no money down. The key is not your money down. All right. It's not no money down. It's not your money down. You still have to pay money to buy a property. The, the lenders still want their down payment, right? But you need to get that money from external sources. So this, so we, we, we devoted 
the next decade to building an organization that provided the right training, the right mentorship, the right coaching, and most importantly, the best community of new and existing real estate investors to create that, that little support cushion that we wish that we had to guide us. And that brings us to the number one problem that people are having today, that millennials are having today, the same problem that we had, which is finding the money for that down payment, right? When the lender says, oh, you need 20% or 30% or that's the biggest obstacle. Now it's 10 times the problem today because house prices are 10 times what they were when I started. So the solution we have is 10 times as valuable uh, than it was, you know, a couple decades ago. That is finding using not any of your own money. I was going to ask the solution, but you shared some of yeah. the secret software. So uh, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Scottsdale, Arizona, and, and I played some golf while I was there. And I got paired with three guys from Canada that were in their 20s, and, and they were on kind of a boys weekend trip down to Scottsdale. And aside from doing the conversion from Canadian dollars to U.S. dollars, it seemed like most everything in the real estate market they were dealing with in Ontario was similar to what millennials are dealing with here. And they had frustration with with some political aspects that were kind of squeezing the middle class. But what do you tell young homeowners? Where where do I even start looking for different mm -hmm. down payment assistance programs or, or what like who do I talk to for advice? Where do I go? Yeah. So uh well there, there's two parts of the where. You know, one is where do I go to get advice and information? And the other question I get a lot is, well, where do I start looking for property? But wh which one of those, which one of those questions, which one of those roads do you want to go down first? Kristen, what do you think? Mm, let's go with the latter. Where do I start looking for property? So that is, it's a great question. And it's probably the most common question that we get. And um, my answer is very simple is it's the wrong question. The question isn't where I should start looking for property. The question is what type of property should I start looking for? Because there's great properties in every market and there's crappy properties in every market. So it, it's not necessarily where you're looking. It is what you're looking for. That is the key. And for me to get at, to, to really explode my portfolio when I was younger, the key was income properties, finding an, a property with income producing potential. And so that's really the key. Uh, where is important when it comes to your primary residence, like where you want to live? Because you you want to live a certain place. You might want to live near the ocean or inland. You might want to live near family or in an urban area or rural area. That's a that's a lifestyle choice. And I can't answer that. But if you want the question, where do I buy the most profitable property? Then the real question is what type of property do I buy that is the most profitable property? And there will always be an income property. If you're going to live there, find something that has two or three units, or even better, something that you can put two or three units in so that you can buy a property that is one unit and you put a second unit in. Now you've forced the value to go up. You could go back to the bank in many cases. You can refinance that property, get a big check without having to sell the property or pay any taxes. And you can use that check to buy the next property and just repeat that model over and over again. That's such a good strategy that I only really recently kind of started to understand and wish I'd known a long time ago. Um, but I, you know, and that's a good strategy for the home buyers themselves. I'm wondering, being a leader in the space, um, if you have thoughts on where, I mean, it, as you mentioned, like home prices have just gone through the roof. They've in, the median down payment we've talked about on here has increased by uh, 172% just in the last three years. So um, how do you, ex or maybe it's 72%, not 172%, <laughs> sorry. Um, but anyway, whatever it is, it's a lot for today's home buyers. Um, and I'm curious if you have thoughts on how we can ease some of the affordability challenges, um, whether that is from a you know, leadership, like industry perspective, or, you know, as a home buyer, how, you know, what are some of the strategies that you, you are talking about around um, affordability? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. It was my second biggest challenge. And it is the second biggest challenge other than finding the money for the down payment. The second biggest challenge is how do I afford the monthly payments? So those are the two biggest challenges that every Every uh, home buyer has today, especially millennials, because they've had less time to save up a down payment and less time to rise through their career to get that income. So they have the the core challenge, and they have this the biggest. And it, it was the same thing I had 23 years ago. So we know how we're going to solve the where do I come up with the money? We have to bring in partners. We have to bring in other people's money. And there's a very strategic way to do that. Uh, the second question here in affordability, 
which is really income and expenses uh, and the the home price. It's it's how can I how can I pay the monthly expense? How can I buy a price at a certain amount and afford it every single month? And uh, this has a little bit to do with where a little. It does have a little bit to do with where, but you you want to look at a couple factors. It, it has less to do with the home price, or or just as much to do with the home price as it does to do with rental income. So I start with rental income because the rental income is the key. That's what's going to get me 23 years ago saying, I want this 400 bucks a month times a hundred properties. You know, I want $40,000 extra a month. It's that rental income. So I start with the rental income and look for a place with a great rent ratio. So the rental income is high relative to the price of houses. That's what's going to get you a great affordability. Because when you move in that house and you live there, and you employ that income property strategy where you add a second unit and you're getting a thousand bucks for the second unit, guess what happens to your monthly payment? It just goes down a thousand dollars. Now, when you do affordability calculation, you could have bought a house for 600,000. It's like you just bought one for $280,000 because your tenants are covering all of those, all of those, uh, half of those payments. Um, and so that's the, the key is finding, some, finding money from somebody else. And this is going to be your tenants. And really quick story to just punctuate this point. The very first house I bought, I bought the biggest, most expensive house I could that was strategically designed. And the reason I bought the biggest, most expensive house I could is because I could fit the most amount of people in there to pay my entire mortgage, pay all of my utility bills and pay all of my expenses every single month. And everyone thought I was crazy. I can't believe you're buying the house. The house was... $477,000 $477,000 at the time. This is decades ago, which was huge. That's a that's a very expensive house back in 2004. Um, and everyone thought I was crazy and I was going to lose my shirt. But here's what I did. I, I had it intentionally designed from the builder so that all of the rooms were in the right place downstairs. And there was doors and separations and the right size windows and a separate entrance. So that when I went and I rented it out, I rented it out to four students and they they paid, it was like 500 bucks a month or whatever it was. Either way, the money completely covered all of my costs. I lived in the biggest house out of anyone I knew for free. That's how I addressed affordability. My affordability was infinity because I lived for free. So that's just a quick story about how that actually translates in the real world. So it's funny. I'm I'm like the mortgage guy to my friends. And so they're like, what, where should I buy? What should I do? And my advice is always, Get like a duplex or a triplex, quadplex in a college town, because then yes. not only are you paying for the mortgage, but you can reset rent year after year after year. There's no rent control on that. And it resets. And it's not like you feel bad about raising the rent for new tenants versus somebody that's loyal. Uh, I I think that's really good advice there. Yeah, As Robbie, you- this, sorry, this is a brilliant point. I just want to I want to underscore what you just said. Uh, I started in student rentals and student rentals are some of the best properties because they have self-evicting tenants. If somebody is watching and they are worried about tenants not leaving or not paying rent, student rentals are self-evicting. You know they're gone after a couple of years. So you know that you don't have to worry about going through the process or having professional tenants for a decade. On top of that, they pay the most amount of money and they almost always pay on time and in full because it's either their student loan or their parents that are paying for them. So I got to just, that is exactly, I love it. It's brilliant. Student rentals, um, self-evicting tenants. Buy near college yes, or university. I want to add one thing. You said get find find ways to get money. And you said from tenants. There's also ways to get money from the government through down payment assistance that I think people should also look into. And as I said to you before the show, our audience is primarily mortgage professionals that are dealing with borrowers. How should they be communicating with young homeowners or borrowers about these things? How should they be educating them? What's the best way to go about it? Yeah, I'd say there's two sides to that. Number one, in terms of communication method is um, tech. I mean, it, it seems obvious, but I got to say it like tech, they're tech savvy. This group is tech savvy. They want to text message. They want to, you know, do different types of messaging than they don't want to answer the phone. So if you're, you know, if you've been a mortgage broker for 40 years or 30 years or 20 years, and you're used to doing business on the phone, like a lot of us are, they're not going to answer the phone. So find a way to communicate with them that works with within the generation. And that's usually like if you can't, if you're not text messaging clients these days, then you know you're losing 20% of your clients. So that's what I would say is embrace technology as much as you can. Um, then uh, the other part of it is you know how to communicate with them as far as the message, because that's the medium you're going to use. 
But the message is really important. And, and just being mindful of the problems that I just talked about, being mindful of the fact that they don't have, they often don't have a down payment and no means to save one. You could save a down payment. When I started, my first down payment was $14,000. Uh, and that might even have been the down payment and the renovation. Today, a down payment could be $100,000 you know, or more in some places. So you got to be mindful that they're not just going to save a down payment like, like we used to. Uh, they have to have other means. And so how can you help them either raise money, bring on investors, uh, use hard money lenders? Often, you know, lenders will have that through their channels. So just being mindful of that problem and then being mindful of the solution of affordability in terms of how can you help them get connect with the right lenders that will allow income properties and student rentals and some of those more unique home buying situations that not every lender likes. I remember uh, we'd have to go through five different lenders with my mortgage broker before we found one that liked student rentals. They thought they were risky and they didn't want to work with them. So working with a mortgage broker, uh, a mortgage professional that understood my problem back then was really important. And for those on the call too, just a reminder, we did have uh, the CEO of Down Payment Resource on um, on our first ever call. So if you missed that um you know, I, I can send it to you, but, um, but also that's a really great resource for accessing what down payment assistance programs are available in your area. So you can look at that. Um, also your home buyers have a portal through that platform as well. So. And Kristen, I, I read a really good article in, in lending tree a couple of weeks ago and the, the headline of it was 94% of Americans say owning a home is part of the American dream. However, there were only 51% that said that they don't think they ever will. And they, they fear that they never will. And Michael, I feel like you're a good person to ask about this. How do we bridge that gap? How do we go from that? So what is that Delta? 43% of people that want to own a home, but don't. How do we close that to where everybody that wants to own a home gets there? Yeah, it's. Uh, I would say the number one thing I would say is changing the mindset that you don't have to save your down payment. And maybe even phrased a little bit differently, it's often impossible to save your down payment in the right period of time. might take a decade to save a down payment. Um, so just changing that mindset that if you realize, think outside the box, realize that you don't have to save that down payment and you don't have to pay all your expenses every month. Those two things, I think when, when people are exposed to those two things, that number of 51% would move up dramatically. People would say, okay, I can do this because those are the biggest challenges that I'm having. Once you remove those, I can actually be a homeowner. Kristen, maybe this is a good time for you to go into a little bit of research that you've done here. If you had slides. Yeah. You okay, cool. Um, so let me know if this, I am coming to you from a small village in Ireland right now. So if my Wi-Fi cuts out or you can't hear me, please stop me, Robbie. Are you in Ireland right now? That's amazing. Am, yeah. <laughs> nice. So I, there's a little bit of chaos when I was getting started here. <laughs> um, yeah. Let me share my screen. And then if I need to, I can just turn off my camera or something too. Are you um, at your neighbor's house as well? Or is this? <laughs> no, I'm in an Airbnb. Um, Perfect. <laughs> overlooking a beautiful field and garden. So it's nice. been really nice over here. Um, so just a couple weeks ago, actually, maybe it was last week, uh, we launched that. Yeah, it was last week because I wasn't able to make this call because I was launching this um, webinar on the first home IQ score. Um, super excited about this. Um, did some, this is on financial uh, financial literacy, but we put together a quiz that basically measured someone's um, knowledge of first time home buying. Um, so pulling from some of the ambassadors and experts involved with First Home IQ, uh, who are professionals in the industry, as well as, um, and then we, through a sponsorship with National MI, we, we um, collected data from 300 people um, of all ages, actually looking at their, uh, what score they got, where they missed the mark and, and that kind of stuff. So you can go to firsthomeiq.com slash get my score and take the quiz. Um, the ideas that we are gonna develop this so that you can actually get education as you take the quiz. So whenever you miss something, it'll tell you why and whatever. Um, for now, it's just a quiz. You just get your score. <laughs> um, so, but I do want to share a few quick, uh, you can also review the full report and like what 
questions people got wrong in that at the bottom of that page as well. Um, but basically, we were measuring in three different areas, preparation, costs around home buying, and then strategies around home buying. Um, so this is kind of, this isn't, we have asked, I think, one or two questions around investing specifically, um, and would love to expand this too down the road towards more like, uh, Michael, your realm as well. Uh, but you can see here how of all ages, it wasn't great. It was still a failing grade, no matter what. <laughs> um, Gen Z millennials really didn't do well. Um, and it's not surprising at all. I think if anything, you know, I mean, we've talked about this a lot on the show of how, um, you know, low our financial literacy is as a generation and as a society. Um, but I thought what was interesting that I wanted to share specifically was, um, a lot of people don't even know that you are getting income verification. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a lot of skepticism around the industry itself. People have like the smartest people. I've really, you know, some really smart friends who have no idea that you, that we have moved beyond, <laughs> uh, we've moved beyond um, the Dodd-Frank world. They don't know what happened through the financial crisis. And um, so I think, uh, and then there's limited knowledge about what a credit score is. Uh, one of the big ones I wanted to share was um, knowledge around down payment and closing costs. Um, so there was a lack of knowledge. I mean, only 39% knew that uh, that closing costs accounted for around two to 5%. Um, and then the, uh, let's see, there's, I wanted to get to down payment. Here we go. So only 25% of next gen, meaning Gen Z and millennials answered um, this down payment question correctly. What is the lowest down payment um, required on a conventional mortgage? Um, so 20, only 25%, 50% thought it was 10%. And when you combine we're at almost like 70% thinking that you need 10% or 20% to uh, as the lowest down payment option on a mortgage. Um, so just to, you know, reiterate what Robbie was just talking about, the need for talking of, about the low down payment options and, um, and, you know, move, moving into that. Um, and then also down payment assistance specifically, there were a lot of misconceptions around that. Most people thought that you needed to repay this, um, you know, right away. And there's obviously a lot of different programs out there, but they didn't realize that it could come in the form of a grant that wouldn't require, um, require the, uh, repayment. So anyway, I you love, can I love that you're this. going through this because you said you expected me to get a hundred percent. You've shared a couple answers here that I might not have gotten correct. Oh my gosh. Uh, what you're supposed to do this before we, where was, where was my link? I thought you were sending me a link. What happened? You are cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to stop sharing right now so you can't get any more answers correct. No, keep going, no. Keep going. no, but actually, I mean, this does cover most of what I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to give a kind of a brief overview of, of this and encourage everybody to take a look at um at this score themselves. Again, you can go to firsthomeiq.com slash get my score. Um, and then when you go to the bottom of that page, you'll see the uh report. So Rob, you can go get all the answers, um, at this, but I do think you'd probably get this correct. It's all, it's all, uh, yeah. First time home buyer kind of education. So, and we've got yeah. a few, uh, few thoughts and, um, questions here, but any, any thoughts before we move into the chat, Michael? Um, I do. Yeah. So I love that tool. Like quizzes, self-assessment tools and quizzes are always so valuable for people. Um, even if you don't get a good, you know, we'll call it score, or even if you don't measure up the way that you thought you would, wouldn't you want to know that? Like, isn't that important information to know that your knowledge is in the middle or, or lower or higher? I love these self-assessments, Kristen, because I like doing them today. And then I like doing some sort of self-improvement process, whether that's getting educated or learning through the school of hard knocks or trial and error, and then taking the same assessment 90 days later, that's where you really get traction. So anyone you know, who's watching, or if you, if anyone watching has clients that are, are going to take this assessment, encourage them to take it twice. I don't know if you've designed it like this and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm overstepping my bounds a little bit, but in my experience, doing things like this twice, 90 days apart is really where you can see the growth, the areas you grow, how much you've grown and really where you can 
where you can grow, continue to grow in the future. So um, it's just a, a comment really, when I see, when I see a this. Really great point, a way for mortgage professionals to be able to use this with their clients, like have them take this up front when you first start working with them or encourage people to take it on social media, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, as you work, work with them, you know, retest their knowledge yeah. or encourage them to retest towards the end of that relationship. And I think that could be a really, it, it can be a great way to show that you're delivering education around stuff that um, is generally really difficult for people to understand or that isn't well known. So. And it makes you unique. It makes you unique as a mortgage professional because 99% of people aren't thinking like this and they're not doing this. So when your clients come to you and you show them a different process, you're like, wow, this is this is a little more special than other people that I've experienced. And it's it's important, you know, if, if you've ever had a personal trainer, when I get a personal trainer, what do they do? The first day one, they take your measurements, they measure your belly, they measure your arms, they measure your legs. And then and then 90 days, yeah, Robbie's like, no, they I don't let them measure me. You measure. And then that's, you want to see that you want to see this because 90 days later, you want to see if you've made a difference and financial literacy, real estate literacy, it's no different. You've got to measure at points in time and you've got to watch that progress or lack of progress. You got to be aware of it. So I loved that. Um, the other important part of doing this more often is a lot of the things that I saw on your screen there, those change over time right? They change with different government policies. They might change from state to state. Uh, they might change their different, each lender might have different policies in terms of things like down payment and uh, closing costs might change as inflation changes. So it's it's always great to do these things uh, more than once so that you can watch changes as they happen in the external environment and internally within yourself. I see we have some questions, no, no, I so I'll stop. <laughs> we, we do, but I, I have a question for you before we get into that. Where should people send their clients or if you're a parent and you have a kid that's in high school for financial literacy when it comes to home buying or even credit cards of sorts, where 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 do people go? Where's a good first step? Yeah, I think it, it depends on how how committed you want to be, right? Like you could go to YouTube and learn learn things on YouTube for free. You can you know, you can go and you can get books. I, I always recommend start I with call. start I with call. books. Yeah. Michael, this, this was a quiz and you got it wrong. The answer is first home IQ, obviously. Kristen, give us the plug. Come on. <laughs> I was like, what, Robbie? Um, and then I was getting into, yeah, assessments. IQ. This is a brand new nonprofit. So totally fine. You don't know about this yet, Michael. But um, yeah, we just launched first home IQ. We're actually really in beta right now. We'll have everything launch, all of the courses by December 1st. Um, so I saw a question in the chat from David asking about sending people there. It is absolutely free of charge. Um, people in the mortgage professionals are supporting this, uh, this so that it is available for free for everyone. Um, we have courses and by December, we'll have a certification uh, that takes people from the very beginning of understanding debt, it, debt, credit, that kind of stuff, all the way through buying and owning your home. Um, so yeah, send people there. Kristen, then I have a question for you. Are you trying to get this in high school curriculums later? How are you going to spread the gospel here? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are... We're yeah having conversations with schools right now and have developed out the curriculum for high schools and colleges, um, and we'll continue to expand what that looks like. But right now, we've got some basic financial literacy and kind of when to rent versus buy. Um, and so if anyone on the call does have a connection with a school, would absolutely love to uh, support that and have a conversation around that. Uh, but yeah, our goal is to get this into schools. That's like one pillar. One pillar is just direct to consumer through different partnerships and your all of your relationships. Um, and then we'll also be supporting people who want to go into their community and do a presentation. So we have presentation materials for people that want to volunteer. That's great. I see your community yeah. is already getting involved in helping out with their communities. That's, a, that's such a great cause. Yeah, great. Oh, Junior Achievement, absolutely great organization. Um, we've had a couple questions for you, Michael. I know there was one in the question box uh, that we can go back to, but um, someone just asked, do you have events coming up if someone is interested in talking more with you, Michael? Yeah, well, great question. So uh, Keyspire is the organization I created to solve all of these problems that have come up over the years for people. We have coaches in the US, coaches in Canada. We have a mastermind group. Uh, we also have easier ways to get involved. They've got a couple books on Amazon. One's Cashflow for Life and Quick Start to Cashflow. I, I, I was going to say, Robbie, I recommend people get, get involved by reading some books, see who you like, 
and go all in on what they do, whether they do a, you know, like we do a coaching and mastermind group, go all in on that. If you like our, you know, what, we, what we talk about, um, but start with, start with something. So we've got our books, we've got a three day boot camp that we do. It's awesome. Um, and it's just like, you learn in three days, what you would normally take years, what would take years to learn. Um, and that's all on our website, keyspire.com. So any level you want to get involved from reading our blog, to buying a book, to going to a boot camp to being in our mastermind group, all of it is just, is great stuff, is great stuff. And you can choose on our website. Perfect. That's so, so great. Um, Robbie, do you want to wrap us up with a market update? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it short per usual. Uh, cool. Three main events I want to talk about, and we'll do them in sequential order. The U.S. payrolls report, uh, what's going on in Israel and in the Gaza Strip, and what's going on in China. So last Friday, we learned that the U.S. economy added 336,000 jobs in September, which is not only huge, but double what expectations were, nearly double what expectations were. Uh, it's not great news, though, because the Fed has been looking to constrict the job market a little, uh, this this robust labor market with its rate hikes of late. And so continued strength in the labor market gives the Fed more runway or more ammo to keep raising rates, uh, which we don't necessarily want. I mean, mortgage rates are creeping up towards 8%, which is backbreaking for people trying to buy a home in a lot of ways. Uh, so keep an eye on that. This week we'll receive PPI and CPI, which which are inflationary indicators. Uh, hopefully we see those dropping. And so the, the Fed won't have that additional pressure to hike rates at its next meeting in November. Uh, it's still kind of a coin toss if they will or won't. Uh, so that they're, they're very data dependent at this point. So all these data points play into it. Second thing I want to talk about is uh, Israel and Palestine or Hamas or Gaza or Lebanon, all tension in the Middle East. Uh, historically, geopolitical tension uh, reduces rates because there's a flight to safety. Uh, countries or investors, excuse me, take their money out of the stock market. They put it in bonds or safer instruments like U.S. treasuries, uh, mortgage-backed securities. Freddie, Freddie and Fannie have a, you know implicit uh, uh, funding by the U.S. government, backing by the U.S. government, excuse me. And so that could help rates. I'm not rooting for a war. I'm not picking sides or I don't want to prolong conflict. Um, but we've already seen rates drop today as, as a result of that. Or rates drop yesterday, rates drop into today as a result of that. The third thing here is China. And this is this could cause kind of a black swan event. And that is that the Chinese developer Country Garden defaulted on the loan. I believe it was for like $187 billion. And some people are saying, yes, this could this is a contained crisis in China. I'm having a hard time believing that this is this is could be a real estate uh, bubble that bursts, causes a big recession in the second largest economy in the world, which would spell trouble for a lot of the rest of the world or those that have their money in China. Uh, you know, we're looking at a depression esque real estate implosion. It's, it's hard to imagine there wouldn't be negative credit consequences outside of the country. Obviously, there are Western investors and banks that have money uh, in China. Silver lining, maybe it could be a reason for the Fed to, to be a little more cautious on continuing to hike rates, considering uh, some of their rate raises led to uh, bank failures here in the United States already this year. So those three events, keep an eye uh, on. And I guess the, the first event would be what what's the Fed's calculus going into this next meeting in December between this robust labor uh, market and then inflationary data. Second event is the Israel conflict. Third event, what's going on in China with potential default uh, we're at 10:45. But any any thoughts or questions before we go, guys? I just want to say, Michael, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Um, I love what Keyspire offers, and um, just your incredible story getting to building that um, that empire and that resource. So thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I love what you're both doing here. The information is amazing, and you've obviously built a great tool for people to use. It was really exciting to see that. I can't wait to do the quiz myself, the assessment. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Good to see you, Robbie. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Have fun in Ireland. Bye, everybody.